So what I'm doing here, um, I've studied floors in earlier videos. I mentioned this um, from the 1800s. I can't study a floor from the 1700s because I can't find one that old around here. But from the 1800s, they would lay a subfloor down of plank, um, whatever they had, cedar, pine, didn't, didn't matter. Hemlock was often used. Um, and then they would lay a second layer down. So we're talking an era before plywood, before insulation. So wooden itself <clears throat> has an R value or a certain level of insulation. So by doubling it up, they double the insulation. But by spanning the gaps, as I'm doing here, so some floor plank leaves a gap as it shrinks, we're going to put a second one that's going to span that. So if you saw in the earlier videos, I used all hand tools for this. So I hand adds these out. So I have some undulations in the floor. So what I'm doing is I'm driving the nails down, which allows me to, to use my plane to take those high points off where, uh, where the next board is going to span it. So for example, right here, I've got a pretty high spot. So I take that down, I'm going to get, take the wiggle wobble of the floor, cover up the drafts, which is the best they could do, double my insulation. And uh, yeah, it's uh, coming along here. Anyway, it's uh, quit raining right now, so I'm going to take a, take a break from this. I've uh, got a good start. I've got my level down. I've got my lengths. I'm starting to work at these undulations and take advantage of the weather and try to get a few more stone down on my chimney. I got basically got three rows of rocks done. It's a slow process uh, around the chimney. Uh, Luke gave me some counsel here, so I am definitely not a stonemason. Um, but what I'm trying to do is stagger the joints so I don't get them all lining up, and I've done a reasonable job. The trick is, it's like a puzzle. Uh, I got rocks strewn everywhere, but it's fine in the rock that fits the spot. Anyway, that hasn't been easy. So I've got a few picked here, and I'm gonna just set these in place and see if they're gonna work tomorrow. This one is an ideal right here, but I'm spanning the gap there. And then I think this guy right here is going to work to span that gap. We'll see in the morning when I get right down to setting some more mortar, but it's, uh, I'm not gonna set or actually mix any more mortar today. And that guy's gonna seal right, that sort of up, crosses that, and that'll seal into the cabin. So at this point, I'm gonna take a stroll and we are gonna walk from the 18th century to the 21st century. So uh, contrary to a lot of people believing that we uh, uh, actually live out in the bush or uh, that the cabin we're building is going to be our long-term home. It isn't. It's uh, going to be our historic retreat. Um, we have another cabin. I'm going to take a walk over there in a minute and show you the first cabin, which was my historic retreat, but has since turned into a short-term rental. So we built the other one. It'll have no modern accoutrements in, of course, but we live in a modern house. Um, my wife uh, and I and a few friends built it uh, 11 years ago. The fascinating part, if you look around me in the backdrop, you, you see the trees we planted. Um, so roughly 10 years ago, it was pretty much a construction site. 
The people who say they no sense planting a tree because you'll never sit in the shade of one. Well, most of these trees weren't up to my knee 10 years ago, and we've given them some pretty good care, but uh, some of them are approaching 20, 25 feet now. So yeah, go plant a tree, good for the environment. And I'm gonna take a walk over to my little cabin, the first one we built, um, and we'll have a look at that. This is a um, little pond in front of the house, and uh, our other cabin we built on the other side. Um, the pond's absolutely perfect for swimming this time of year. It's about uh, 12, 14 feet deep in its deepest spots, and uh, got a few bass in there if one needs supper. So, yeah, source of food as well as uh, recreation and cooling off in this hot summer. Anyway, I'm off to the cabin. This is a real leap forward. Um, this is our little pump house down by the pond. And we have a single battery in it, a little photovoltaic panel, uh, and an RV pump. And we pump water up to a, to a shower. I can't, uh, you know, my love of history, and I think of uh, the 18th century, what they would have done for a shower. Uh, they wouldn't know what the word meant because there was no such thing. They had baths. Um, but anyway, we turn the little pump on here, and we'll head up to my outdoor shower. So in the 18th century, they had uh, food caches to store their food. Uh, basically an outdoor uh, refrigerator or freezer in mm, anywhere from five, four to five months of the year, depending on how far north one was. And uh, what they do is have a ladder that they put up and down to get their food. And generally they would wrap the four legs with tin to keep the bears and the squirrels out. So yeah, I'm gonna have to build another one of these back at my cabin build because I ain't moving this bad boy. But I decided to incorporate the shower into the base of it, and let's have a look at that. So we have uh, we have an on-demand propane heater, little thing you put down for you reenactors. There's a piece of canvas so it's, uh, off of an old uh, Civil War tent of mine. Um, got a propane on-demand propane heater, and with any luck, this thing's going to work. So I'm going to fire this bad boy out. And there goes the heater, and there's the hot shower. <laughs> I just, I just think of them living in the same clothes for month after month and sponge bathing in the cabin in the middle of winter. And uh, yeah, we uh, we have all these modern conveniences. And that's the shower. And what's a cabin without an outhouse? Anyway. Uh, Probably the second most important building on the property right there. Anyway, into the cabin. When I first built this cabin, I was thinking of using it sort of as a chief factor's uh, cabin at a Hudson Bay post. So and that was a symbol that they, um, that they stamped in all the bales that went to so Hudson Bay and the beaver symbol and that that was stamped on millions of bales of furs that crossed the atlantic ocean during the height of the fur trade and anyway, let's have a look inside
there are uh, a lot of things in this cabin that you wouldn't find in a 18th century cabin. So the one we're building back, way back in our woodlot here, um, it, it's going to be as historically accurate as we can make it. So they didn't, for example, they didn't have polo lanterns. Um, the first very primitive forms of lanterns, uh, other than the Betty lamp, didn't come out till late 1700s, 1780 or so. Um, they certainly didn't have uh, wood stoves. They had fireplaces, um, <laughs> propane cookers. So all these things um, they wouldn't have had. I'm sitting on uh, a piece of history, and it's absolutely a stunning piece. It's a woodworker's bench, and it came out of a shipbuilding yard in Smith's Falls, Ontario. So it's circa uh, circa 1840s, 1830s, 1840s. Still as a working vice with wooden threads. Um, anyway, this one's going to have them figured out <laughs> exactly how I'm going to do it because it's about... I would say six or 700 yards uh, through the forest to our cabin belt. And uh, somehow I got to get this thing. I'm not sure what it weighs. My guess is about 200 pounds, 250 pounds. And so I got to get it back there and I'll build a new countertop for the little cabin here. So absolutely my favorite piece in the cabin. My second favorite piece is over here. And uh, this, uh, this little rocking chair was built by the Amish. Uh, down in New York State, and uh, we lived down there for a spell. And uh, I don't care if you're 100 pounds soaking wet or 300 pounds, this is the most ergonomic chair ever built. And it's not historically accurate, so it won't be, sadly, yeah, it's sadly it won't be back at our at our new cabin bill. We're trying to sort of make that like a museum, but uh, we got thunder in the background here. It's raining outside. I can hear the rain on the tin roof, and I might just sit here for a spell. But I am going to take a wander up to the house and uh, show you when we're not living in the bush, which is quite often uh, where we actually live. There, the last stitch in another project. So I've just, uh, yeah, first of all, this is my sewing chair and I've made a lot of things in this chair, everything from the bottoms of my feet to the top of my head. So uh, it's, it's the place we make our stuff. And we, uh, this particular project is, uh, is a new haversack. Uh, so it's brain tanned deer hide, which we, we tan ourselves. It's lined with uh, pillow ticking. And I've, I've hand woven, um, or I've actually used an ankle loom, which didn't, I'm pretty sure didn't date into the 18th century, but certainly into the early 19th century, I think invented in Ireland. And I use that for different patterns of straps. A little decorative thing on the front there. This is pretty much a standard size of a haversack worn by everyone. Uh, Europeans and natives, um, both genders, uh, certainly in the military, uh, use them generally out of canvas or tarred canvas. Uh, anyway, today is uh, is Canada Day and um, I guess for the first first time uh, ever, I'm struggling with 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 the day. Um, after the recent findings of all the unmarked graves at our residential schools, I, I mean, it, it's a history that that we thought had happened, but now there's clear evidence, and uh, it's a pretty disturbing history. And so my fascination with history is, spans back decades. But I realized about 15 years ago that I knew virtually nothing about 
uh, indigenous culture, indigenous history on this continent, and lots about European history. And that's always told by the victor, right? So I'm, I'm getting this aside from the people who always won. So I started on this journey and it's been a fascinating one. And um, as a result of that, I, I have nothing but admiration and respect for the, uh, for the native culture on this continent. So my day-to-day -day Canada day is going to be spent in, uh, I guess from this point on, I'm going to finish my work and just uh, sort of reflect on the history of this country.